Turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 12, reading the first four verses. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, or because of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. That which we have in these several verses really ties together a lot that we've been talking about. It deals with hamartiology, the doctrine of sin here. It deals with the doctrine of man. It goes back to the doctrine of God and wraps up a lot of that in one particular passage. And this is why I wanted to take the passage more or less as a conclusion to these 20 sessions that we have been in. When he begins with verse 1, you'll notice that he begins with a wherefore, therefore leading you back to the preceding context of Hebrews chapter 11 where he has named the heroes of the faith, so to speak, those who have run for God, and they have run victoriously. Many of them have been martyrs. Many of them did not live to see the fulfillment of all of the promises, but they have run faithfully for God. And now he says, on the basis of that, because we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, all of these who have run before us, let us then make certain preparations for the race that we have Let's have certain caution, certain understanding, and certain direction in order that we too may run successfully as they have run. As you look at this passage, you become very much impressed by the apparent importance of athletics in the first century among the New Testament writers. The Apostle Paul oftentimes refers to the events of the athletic arena as well as the events of the battlefield. And in this particular passage, it's the athletic event. It's the Olympic Stadium. And though we have a lot of interest in them here, we don't begin to have the powerful influence today in the world of sports that they had in that day. For in that day, during the one-month festivities of the Olympic Games, which started back in 776 B.C., during that one month, everything else was canceled. Uh, if there was a war going on, the war ceased during that time. These games were a month-long feast, a festival in honor of the god Zeus. And we don't exactly honor him today when we come together, but that was the beginning. Now, it's that kind of illusion, then, that Paul has in mind when he is speaking. I think we need to practice our study of the historical context here in order to really get the picture that he's talking about. As you look at the text itself, you recognize that there's only one verb in the text. You might say, well, there's a verb, let us lay aside, and uh, so on and so forth. Actually, the only verb in the two verses is the verb run at the end of verse 1. The others are verbals, they are participles or something else. The word run is the main verb. So everything else centers around the word run. So all of the imagery centers around the race. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about a Christian race under the analogy of the runner at the Olympic Games. Now, interestingly enough, the first part of the verse then gives to you the preparation of the runner. And I would like to suggest to you that the thesis of those first few phrases would be running demands reducing. And in the historical situation, we certainly can learn much that is instructive at this point. It demands reducing in two ways. It demands reducing in stripping off all of the weights and it demands reducing by trimming off all of the pounds that are excess. 
In the Olympic preparation, a runner prepared intensively for 10 months in advance of the games. And much of the preparation involved running with weights. History seems to confirm that they would wear brass weights around their ankles and a brass girdle around their middle. In addition to that, they would wear a long flowing robe. And in practice, they would run with this in order to build endurance so that when they stripped all of this off, they could take off with the fleet-footedness of a deer. Now, I've been interested in noting various advertisements in magazines today that we've got the same idea. Maybe some of you have seen this ad over and again. And it says, no diet, no exercise, a waist-reducing belt. Just wear the belt. And the weight of the belt, the action of the belt, will take the waist down simply by your normal activities of a day. Here is a waist-reducing belt for those who are interested. That's something like what he was talking about back here. In the preparation for the games, they had these weights, and now when you come to the race, you strip off all of the weights. Now, it's not too difficult to go back historically and find out what weights were. We've done that. But it's a little more difficult to make the transference from the physical weight that the writer was talking about to the obvious spiritual weight that he is talking about as he draws the allusion here. What is a weight in a believer's life? Sometimes the best way to define something is by telling what it is not. And then you find it easier to find what it is. Negatively stated, a weight was not something sinful in itself. Now, how do we know that? In the next statement, he says that they are to strip off the sin as well. So first he talks about the weight, then he talks about the sin. The weight is not something that is sinful in itself, nor is it something that would necessarily be sinful to another. If this were something that he was talking about that is an absolute, that is sin all the time, every place where it is perpetrated, then he could name it. Paul doesn't hesitate to name sins. Time and again, he names the sins of the mouth, the sins of the flesh, various kinds of sin in the word of God. But here we have no naming of the sin or of the weight in either case, but rather simply saying the weight. So I take it that it is something that is not essentially sinful and it is something that may not be a weight to another. This is why I didn't name it. Weights differ with people. What is a weight to one is not a weight to another. On the positive side then, I would make this statement that a weight, positively stated, is anything that hinders maximum efficiency. So that in the Christian race, the duty of the runner is to free himself from associations and engagements, which, however innocent in themselves, hinder the freedom of his action. And if it does not help, it hinders. Or to put it in a more graphic way, if it is not a weight, it ought to be a wing. If it is not a wing, it is a weight. In other words, the thing either will propel me onward or it will draw me back. The weights are things that are not wings. They are things that rather hold me back. They hinder my maximum efficiency for God. Now, how do you identify such a weight? Well, it was not too difficult in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense, it might be a little more difficult. But I believe there is a process that can work very effectively in identifying weights. Let's try to make the analogy from the physical again. I think the best way that I know of to identify weight is by running. I can sit in a chair before a table and eat and eat and eat and eat and perhaps not really have it bother me 
Perhaps if I just kept sitting there and sitting there day after day and eating the eat, why the fat could start flowing over the side of the chair. <laughs> and it would not really be a major problem until I got up and started to walk. It may not be even a real problem when I walk, but if I start to run, then the problem really grows intense. And if I were to run up this hill down here at the village, then you could just scoop me up with a shovel when I got to the top. I don't know of any better way to identify weight than by running. It brings all sorts of things to light. Now that is precisely why Dr. Bright and others on the staff here are so intensively interested that sharing Christ, for example, should be a very real part of IBS that we should not merely sit and soak and sour, but that we should soak up a lot of truth and then get out and activate it. For it is by running that we will identify our weights. And as far as I can understand it, witnessing concerning Christ is one of the major ways that a Christian runs. There may be many other activities in the race. It may be a veritable spiritual decathlon. Prayer and reading my Bible and witnessing and a number of other things. But certainly witnessing hits right at the heart of it, of running. So if I want to identify my weights, my own set, then I need to start activity. I need to start running the race. Now, once I start running, then I also need, secondly, to be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. I ought to be characterized, if you were to draw a character comic strip of a person, you ought to draw it as a, a sensitive Christian being one who has great big ears and a little tiny mouth. That is, people who have really learned to listen to God's Word. A number of years ago, I had the opportunity of riding a tremendous horse in eastern Oregon that was very, very well trained. And I was not equally well trained. And I hadn't been used to riding this type of horse, the kind I usually ride. You have to kick them and beat them and hit them. And everything else to get him to do anything. Jerk the reins one way and jerk them another way. On this particular horse, he didn't have to do any of that, but they didn't tell me that. And I shall never forget that <laughs> I got onto this horse and I usually leaned forward quite a ways. This horse had been taught that just to lean forward a bit, it took off. <laughs> To lean forward more than a bit, it took off faster. To lean way forward, gone. And I got on, and I leaned way forward, and that horse took off, and I stayed right there. Now that is called a, believe it or not, meek horse. Men in the Kentucky Derbies who have been winners again and again have said the greatest qualification in a horse is a meek horse. A meek horse is a horse that responds to the least movement of the jockey. And you barely lay the reins one way or another way, and you've got action. You move your body one way or another way, and you've got action. God says that I am to be a meek person, James 1.21. I am to be sensitive. God ought not to have to beat me over the head with a two-before to get through to me. I used to exercise horses for the Multnomah County Fair and I never, ever saw a jockey get up in the saddle with stirrups on and begin digging those stirrups into his horse. Those kind of horses don't need that. They're meek horses. All they need is a little indication. I've got to be that way. 
That's where the word of God comes in. By having the word of God settled down in my heart, it becomes the working principle so that then as I start to run, the spirit of God has got raw material that he can rely on. He can come back and probe me lightly in one place or another and immediately there is the response. Because in the activity of running now, he brings back all of the resource that I've put down there of the word of God that he can now work on. So he applies it. But I've got to have a mind in a heart and attitude to listen to what God is saying through that which I put in my heart. That's the second step. A third thing that I believe is mandatory, and I believe in this order, by being honest. I believe we do it by running, by listening to the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, and by being honest. And many of us are terribly dishonest. Not with other people, with ourselves. We lie to ourselves. We cheat ourselves through all kinds of rationalization gimmicks. And if I'm going to really run effectively, I've got to be honest. You know, if that guy has given training regulations and he sits down to a meal and eats that which he is not supposed to eat because nobody is looking, who is he hurting? Only himself. A couple of years ago, I was sitting down to eat with Joe Warkentine, the national decathlon champ at that time, and was preparing for Olympic competition. And I'd never seen a guy who scrutinized what he ate more than he did. He not only could name the things in his plate, like peas and carrots and potatoes, and there weren't any potatoes there, but he could give you the chemical elements in them, practically, and the grams that were involved. And he worked out six hours a day every day. He didn't even carry a job. His wife was working so that every day he could work out six hours a day so he could win some piece of metal in the Olympic Games. Now that's not to decry the thrill of that kind of a contest. But boy, that sure pales into insignificance when we think of the contest we're in. You know, I hear people say, uh, this is one of those dishonest gimmicks, really, to excuse their much activity, they say, well, I don't want to rust out for God. I want to burn out for God. Well, I just may not be pious enough, but frankly, I don't want to burn out or rust out. I just want to live out. It took me 23 years of school to learn anything. It takes some of us longer than others. And I want to use it for a while. I don't see any particular advantage in cutting my life short. Now, if God wants to do that, that's his problem, but I'm sure not going to help him cut my life short. And I think we do all kinds of dishonest things, deceiving ourselves. If I want to be a victor, when I identify the weights, I've got to run. I've got to run. And I've got to listen while I'm running. And I've got to be honest after I've listened so that I don't try to make an excuse for rationalization. And when I do that, I may begin to find such things as this. I might find that there's a friendship which I have which is too engrossing. Maybe a perfectly honorable friendship, but it's just too engrossing and I've got to cut it off. In my particular situation. And I am the only one who knows all the facets of my life. Or I might find that there is a habit that I have that is sapping my strength. Maybe a good clean habit like overeating. I may find that there is a lack of discipline in my life, in leisure time, that I blow too much time, I don't redeem the time. I might find that I have a lazy, undisciplined mind and I need to set down some regulations for my mind in order to bring every thought into captivity. A lot of things will begin to come to light as I go through this process of identifying weights. Now, the second thing that the writer says you need to trim off in preparation for the race is the sin pounds. And let us lay aside the sin which does so easily beset us. Now the word for sin here is a very interesting one. It's the only time that it occurs in the entire word of God. So there's no parallel you can make to it. This is a case where you can't run to a concordance and say how is it used someplace else because it isn't used anyplace else. Again, it's one of those hapax legomenas, a once only writing. So the best you can do is try to get a literal etymological meaning from 
your lexicon or dictionary. When you do that, you'll come up with this kind of a statement, perhaps, and I suggest this is a possibility for the sin which does so easily beset us. Quote, readily encircling for ambush and entrapment. Readily encircling for ambush and entrapment. Interestingly enough, the word is related to a military term which is used in a war or in sieges and in hunting, meaning to encompass or the encircling movement that goes along with it. In my mind, I can envision a guy out in a jungle in North Vietnam, for example, and he knows the enemy is all around him out there in the dark. But he doesn't know anything about this territory. They know this territory perfectly, but he doesn't know anything about it. He's a stranger walking through it for the first time. And he knows they're out there all over, but he can't see them. So he is vigilant. He is sober. He is watching every minute. He never lets his guard down. And they are encircling him, waiting to find a lax moment. And they are seeking to be as still and quiet as they possibly can to make it seem like this place that is infested with danger is really quite peaceful and calm and there is no threat here at all. And that's the tactic that the devil uses in this particular sin. Notice it doesn't name the sin once again. It doesn't name it. A lot of people have tried to name it. They like to make it for everybody else. But God didn't name it. And the reason he didn't name it is because you can't name it. That is, it is different for all kinds of people. Each of us are at different levels of development. But there is always going to be the same methodology. There is that procedure whereby a person plays with that sin which to them seems rather innocent and harmless. And it continues to encircle you. And it presents itself to you as a generous friend. And it says to you, come on. There could be no harm in this. Just once. No problem. And soon, when your guard is down, when you've begun listening to the wrong source, you're not thinking about what God said about it. You've been listening to the wrong source. You play with it long enough until you partake. And then, the devil points his long, bony finger at you and says, Guilty. 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 I think most of us have had that kind of experience at some time or another. Play with the thing long enough, presents itself as a generous friend, harmless and innocent. And then when you partake, guilty, and you feel like a rat, and unacceptable to God, and he makes you feel as bad as you can possibly feel. Now, too many Christians specialize in playing on the perimeter of the acceptable. Harry Ironside used to have a message entitled Playing on the Perimeter. And it was with regard to this passage. And he gave an illustration which to me was very vivid. He told of a superintendent of a driving concern that was looking for a driver to drive a large truck over a very dangerous route that involved road at time that was only one lane of traffic and high mountains and cliffs and all the rest. And he began to interview men for this job. And he interviewed three men. And he asked them all the same question. He explained to them the situation and said, Now, how close do you think you could drive to the edge of that cliff without going off? And the first driver responded. He thought he could drive within a, a foot of the edge of the cliff and not go off. He thanked him, brought the second one in, gave him the same situation, asked him the same question, how close could you come? He said, well, I've had a lot of experience. And he said, I think I could drive within six inches of the edge of the cliff and not go off. And he thanked him and brought the third driver in and asked him the same thing, same set of circumstances. How close could you come? The driver said, well, sir, I've driven for many years. I've got a good accident-free record. And he says, I think I could drive very close to the edge of that cliff. He said, but I want to assure you of something. I'd stay as close to the other side of the road as I possibly could. And he said, you're hired. Too many Christians specialize in how close can I come to the forbidden without getting into trouble. If 
find this time and again in the relationships of men and women in college, premaritally. How far can I go? Time and again you get that question. How much can I do? How far can I go without getting into trouble? Rather than saying, you know, I'll stay way to the other side. Yeah, I don't want to get into trouble. I don't want to dishonor Christ. No, we test it. We play with it. And the more we flirt with it, the more alluring it becomes. And the devil has got his set for everybody. And yours are not mine, but I've got mine. I want to assure you that when I walk downtown in San Bernardino and walk by a tavern, that doesn't bother me one bit. When I see a group of people who are hooked on drugs, I don't have any allurement to that at all. Those things are not my problem. Alcohol, drugs, so forth. But I have my problems. And I don't intend to elaborate them for you. But God knows them and I know them. And I know that there are areas of my life where the devil never relaxes. And if I would relax, that would be just exactly the thing he would want, to let down my armor at that point, and that would be the occasion for the vulnerability for his fiery darts. Continual vigilance. Now he says, trim off the sin pound and strip off the weight, the entangling garment. If you really are interested in success in the race. Now the average run-of-the-mill person who doesn't care about winning won't exercise this kind of thing on his body. But Paul will, who says, I beat my body, I keep it under, lest that by any means after I have preached to others I myself should be disqualified. Historically, when those guys stripped, they really stripped. Our word gymnasium comes from the Greek word gumnas, which means naked, and that's the way they ran. And I noticed that track stars today don't run in football outfits. In fact, that little pair of shorts they wear can almost be wrapped up in one hand. And the track shoes are not like football shoes, they're quite different. He gets down to the bare minimum, and God says, run light. Don't carry a lot of excess baggage with you. Get rid of the things that hinder your maximum efficiency. Run like a winner, trimmed for victory. Now, just briefly, he gets down to that which follows this in the running. And this is almost like the heavenly coach coming into the dressing room now just before he sends them out onto the track. And he says, just one last word. I want to remind you what kind of a race I've entered you in. And he gives them two clues. He says, run with patience the race that is set before you. He says, get it square in your mind now what kind of a venture you're going into. This is the with patience race. It is not a sprint. It is not a hundred yard dash. It's cross country. It's marathon. And I'd like for you to end up at the end of the race. I don't know much about running, but I've watched some people run. And I take note that people that run a 100-yard dash run differently than people that run several miles. They start off differently. They pace themselves differently. There are a lot of people who go away from a place like this, they're just really hot to go. And they go 50 yards and they're exhausted. They've had it. God says, look, we got a with patience race, a marathon race, a cross country. And good cross country runners still have some steam left when they get to the end of the race. And so of all things, at the end of the race, you find them able to pick it up and for the last 25 yards almost sprint into the finish. They pace themselves. So he says, it's a long race. Prepare yourself for it. And he says, it's set. It's appointed. And that's where my theology proper really comes to bear. Because when I look at who my heavenly coach is, I get excited. My heavenly coach knows everything about the racetrack. He knows everything about me. And he has appointed the race. He is entering the contestants 
He said, keep it in mind when you go out on the track. Let's run the marathon and let's remember that it's appointed. I've prepared you. I'll not put you in an event that I haven't prepared you for. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And then the last thing he closes out on is beautiful. What should be the focus of the runner while he's running? Verse 2. Looking unto Jesus. And if you look at your marginal notes, if you have it here, the word unto is really a double preposition. And it means looking away from unto Jesus. Looking away from everything else unto Jesus. Now there are a lot of things that could distract a runner. But a good runner keeps his eyes on the goal, his mind on the goal. I don't have with me a quotation that I, I think it was given by John Landy when he was running a mile down in Australia. I wish I had it with me now, but whoever was running in that race with Landy and the other miler, the one that lost said afterwards that at a point in a race, he knew he was ahead, but he didn't know how far ahead he was. And he chanced to turn around to look to see where the competitor was. And he lost his stride. And he lost the race. A good runner is not going to be distracted by other objects. I've never yet been on a track watching anybody run where a runner off to a good start is cheered by his school and so he stops, takes a bow, thank you, sure appreciate it. Never seen that. Never seen it. Nor have I ever seen a runner who got started and the other side started booing and he stopped and put up his fist and said, oh yeah, want to fight about it? Never seen that. Isn't that strange? A runner is not distracted by the boos or the cheers. He is aware of them. You can't help but be aware of them. But if he's a good runner, he's got his eye on the object. Jesus is our object. And in this book, our Lord is presented under that human name, Jesus, repeatedly. Unlike the other books that speak of his exalted position as Lord Jesus Christ, here it's Jesus. Why? Because he's constantly directing us back to Jesus, the man who learned obedience through suffering, who went the way that we have gone and is already into the port and therefore we're to follow in his steps. He said, look at the life of Jesus Christ and master it because in it are all the principles you need for walking like you ought to walk. So First John can say, he that saith he abideth in him ought so to walk even as he walked. Or Peter can say we are to follow his example. We're to walk in his steps. Or Hebrews 12 can say looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The one who started it and the one who will finish it. Or Philippians 1, 6, he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Look unto Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Be thinking the things that Jesus Christ thought. Jesus is my pattern in the Gospels. Let me conclude with an illustration. My wife and I were driving across northern United States one time to go over to the East Coast. In going across northern Idaho, we were going up toward the Continental Divide. And sometime before the snow started to come, and snow kind of scares my wife, so she began to exhort me to put chains on. And frankly, I think that chains sometimes do more harm than good in snow. And so I didn't pay much attention to her, and she took note of that and kept exhorting me. We moved along the highway, and finally we went by a service station where a lot of people were getting chains. She said, don't you think you ought to buy some chains? And So I pulled in and found out they were charging about twice as much as they ought to charge for them, just taking advantage of the people, and so I went on back out, and we drove on again and started to go up the hill and gone past some other places, and she noted some cars that slid off the side of the road, and so she continued to exhort me about, don't you think you ought to stop and put the chains on? And finally she saw a freighter that had slid off the side of the road. She began to get pretty nervous. And under all of this harassment from the right side of the front seat, <laughs> by a backseat driver's license, I got a bit upset and I just decided to spin around in that road and go back on down to the bottom again. And so I whirled around the middle of the road. And it was a beautiful white sheet of snow out there, just nothing bothering you. On know, one side was a bank and the other side was a drop-off. And this beautiful white sheet in between. A little hard to figure out where the road was, but it was there someplace. And it was making her a bit nervous. So well, I looked at my odometer 
when I turned around and went back down to the bottom of the hill. I got down to the bottom. There's a little service station there at the bottom. It was one of those kind. It's a combination of everything. You know, they've got a little gas, a little grocery, and a little variety, and a, a path and an outhouse and everything else that you need for emergency. And we got all taken care of there. I asked the fella, how far is it to the top of the hill? And he said, five miles. And I had been 4.2 miles up that hill. And I just felt sick. I thought eight-tenths of a mile from the top. And I turned around and came back down. My wife didn't have anything to say, and that was fortunate for her. (laughs) And we went back out, we got in the car again, and we started up the hill. But my wife sat there with perfect peace. She did not harangue me. She did not tell me how to go get chains. She didn't tell me anything now. She sat there and I sensed that she had real calmness about her. You know what made the difference? Between the time that we had come down and the time we went back out to go back up again, two cars had gone by. And they had left two sets of tire tracks in the snow. So that there no longer was that vast white blanket out there with a cliff on one side and a bank on the other. But now there were two sets of fresh tire tracks. Somebody has been this way before. And it changed her whole sense of well-being. We were now following somebody that was still ahead of us, and I knew they were ahead of us because the tracks were there. And I could follow in their tracks. That's exactly what God is saying to us. God is saying, I have laid the tracks down in Jesus. He has been this way before. Now then, with that recognition, look away from everything else unto Jesus and consider Him and you cannot help but come out on top.